The word bulb to a plant person can mean so many things. It's used as a generic catch-all term. Gardeners use the word bulb to refer to any plant that stores energy for its seasonal dormancy cycle in an underground storage organ, basically saving food for winter. Only certain plants have true bulbs and it's a minefield of misinformation if you search online. What growers call bulbs can be technically divided into five categories. That's true bulbs, corms, tubers, rhizomes and tuberous roots. As this is predominantly an aroid channel, let's first look at what this all means in botanical terms and then we can see how it relates to aroids in general. No matter what kind of storage organ the plant has, they all serve the same general function. They store food to carry the plant through dormancy and get them started on the following growing season. True dormancy doesn't exist in bulbs. Although little or no external growth is visible, a bulb continues to develop internally. In tulips, for example, the flower buds form during dormancy. In aroids like Amorphophallus and Sauromatum, a new petiole, the thing that holds the leaf up, or peduncle, the thing that holds the inflorescence up, is prepared and ready for the next active period. Dormancy is usually brought on by external factors like cold weather or a change in how wet or dry the environment is. And as growers, we can encourage dormancy by withholding water or digging up and storing bulbs. I've done a few videos recently about how I store my bulbs and tubers. True bulbs. A true bulb is probably the one type that is most well known by non-gardeners. A true bulb is a package of fleshy scales wrapped in a tunic. They usually have a small basal plate and a shoot at the top that emerges from deep within the bulb. Scales are modified leaves and contain the food necessary to sustain the bulb during dormancy and into the next active growth cycle. They may be loose and open like those of a lily or tight and compact like those of a hyacinth. If a tight bulb is cut in half horizontally, the scales are visible as rings. And during the growing season, new bulbs called bulbets or offsets form from buds next to or around the edges of the scales at the bottom of the bulb. Tulips, amaryllis, daffodils, hyacinth, ornamental onions, snowdrops and lilies are all examples of true bulbs. Slice that bulb open and you'll see a complete embryonic plant inside with tiny flowers, stems, leaves and roots. The fleshy scales which surround the embryo store the food for the plant. Bulbs can be described as tunicate or non-tunicate based on their anatomy. A tunicate bulb has the outer scale covering called a tunic and that prevents it from drying out and it isn't as attractive to herbivores. An example could be onion, garlic, narcissus and amaryllis. A non-tunicate bulb doesn't have the papery outer tunic, but instead it's got scales that are quite succulent and separate and give the bulb a different appearance overall. A good example would be a lily. The roots usually emerge from the bulb's basal plate, which is also how the fleshy scales are held together. Some bulbs reproduce by a process called annual replacement. Other bulbs, such as dafts and hyacinths, reproduce by offsets. In these bulbs, the mother bulb continues to grow and the new bulb or offsets are produced alongside the mother bulb. Corms. A corm is essentially a specialized stem that is used for storage. So a corm is a stem. Leaves and flowers arise from the buds on the stem and they can produce contractile roots that are primarily used to pull the corms further into the ground if needed. Corms are usually round and slightly flattened and there's a wide variation in them. The corms are different than true bulbs, which are often pointed at the top where the new above ground growth is going to emerge from. If you cut a corm in half, you can see that it's a solid mass rather than layered rings or scales. The outer tunic of corms tends to be fibrous. At the top are one or more growth points or eyes and roots in a corm emerge from the basal plate usually rather than from the top or from the body of the storage mass. As the plant grows, the old corm shrivels and new corms called cormels form around it. If a new cormel is large enough and old enough, it may produce flowers the following year, but normally it takes a couple of years or up to three years, depending on the species. 
Crocuses, Mumbretia, Gladiolus, Autumn Crocus, Freesia, and Dog's Tooth Violets are also corn. Tubers. Tubers are specialised storage stems as well. Just like a corm, a tuber is a solid mass of food storing stem and it doesn't take up water or nutrients. They lack both the basal plate and the outer tunic covering in most cases. Roots and shoots grow from growth buds, which are called eyes, on the surface of the tuber. Some tubers, such as caladiums, diminish in size as the plant grows and new tubers form at, at the eyes. Others, such as tuberous begonias, increase in size as they store nutrients during the growing season and develop new growth buds at the same time. Tubers come in a wide variety of different shapes and sizes. Caladiums, gloriosa, lilies and even potatoes grow from tubers. Rhizomes. Rhizomes are thickened, branching storage stems. So again, they are stems. They are solid like corms and tubers, but they don't have a covering tunic usually. Most rhizomes grow laterally, just along and slightly below the surface of the soil, but some rhizomes grow several inches deep. Roots often develop on the underside of a rhizome, and during the growing season, new plants sprout from buds along the top. To propagate a rhizome, you cut the stem into sections, making sure each one contains one of the eyes, an axillary bud. If it's an indoor aroid, you sometimes hear this called a node. Anubius, ginger, cannas, um, cordelias, lily of the valley are all rhizomes. Some types of iris grow from rhizomes, but others are true bulbs. So what about stolons? You may have heard the word stolon or runner. A stolon is a stem that grows along the surface of the ground, unlike rhizomes that are usually underground. Adventitious roots are produced wherever there is a node, and axillary buds on the runner can develop into upright shoots. The internodes of a stolon can die off once there's a new plant and it's well established. Plants with this feature include colocasia and strawberries. They differ from rhizomes in that they're never the main stem of the plant, rather an offshoot from an existing stem. Tuberous roots. Tuberous roots look like tubers, but they're actually swollen nutrient storing roots. Botanically, tuberous roots differ from true tubers because tubers are modified stem tissue. During the growing season, they grow fibrous roots to take up nutrients and water. New growth buds or eyes appear on the base of the stem where it joins the tuberous root. This area is called the crown, and to divide it, just cut off a section of the tuberous root with a portion of the crown containing an eye. Dahlia, sweet potatoes, daylilies, foxtail lilies, all grow tuberous roots. Aroid storage organs. So onto aroids then. In some ways we've made this quite easy by understanding what all these types of storage organs actually are. Plants in the Raceae family, commonly known as aroids, pretty much have tubers or rhizomes. There's no examples of true bulbs, the storage organs comprised of modified leaves that I could find. So let's just clarify then. So a tuber is mostly parenchyma cells with some vascular tissue. And parenchyma cells are essentially for activities like photosynthesis, for storage, assimilation, respiration, excretion, and radial transport of water and minerals. It's got an outer layer and some subdermal vascular tissue, but the rest is just parenchyma. It is almost entirely a starch storage organ. Inamorphophallus, aracema, arum and typhonium, and many more genus. The stem tissue is all encased in a small area on the top of the tuber. That then produces the peduncle or the petiole or both, and also the roots. A corm then is comprised entirely of stem tissue. It is literally an underground stem. It has an epidermal layer, a vascular cylinder with phloem and xylem and central pith, a corm can also be a starch storage organ, but it still has true stem tissue. The new foliage comes from the top and the roots come from the basal plate at the bottom in most cases. There's many examples of Aracea with rhizomatous features. Remember, rhizomes are thickened branching storage stems with segmented sections containing points for upward growth and also for roots. They are a continuation of the main stem, unlike stolons that branch from the main stem. 
Examples can be found in aroids from a wide variety of environments, including the mostly aquatic Anubius, epiphytic genus such as Raphidophora, and wetland genus including Lysochiton. A bulbil found on a leaf axle, the bit where the leaf meets the petiole, is simply a tuber. It does cause confusion because of the name. So with all that knowledge at your disposal, go out and have a look at your aroids. When you unpop them, take a look at what's in front of you and try and work out whether you've got a tuber, a corm, a rhizome, or whether you've got a tuberous root, or in fact, none of the above, and you've just got a different plant altogether. Most of these features come from um, plants that have a dormancy cycle. So if you're looking at aroids that are from hot climates or from tropical climates, then there's a very good likelihood that they will just have roots straight from the stem with no underground starch storage um, system whatsoever. So have a good look at that with your indoor plants and see the difference between those and your hardy aroids. I've pieced this information together from quite a few books and research papers. So if you want to have a look, have a look at the comments down below and you can see all of the different places where I have researched all the information that I've just imparted. Researchers and botanists are updating this kind of information all the time. And if you read some of the very top end literature, such as Aroids by Denny Brown, you can see um, here there's an example. So as a rule, tubers in Aroids are formed from the stem and not the roots. The few exceptions are a few of the African genus in which the roots are swollen and fleshy. And whether Aroid tubers are technically corms is debatable, but they're often referred to as such. So even at the top end of the botanical research world, um, there are going to be changes and people will have differences of opinions based on the available data. So take what you can from this video. Hopefully you've learned a lot. And if you've got any errors that you found in there, then please let me know and we can discuss them in the comments down below. I really hope you're enjoying these videos and if you are please consider subscribing to the channel it does help us build and get our content in front of other people who might like it and if you're going to do that then why not subscribe to the channel and join us every week when we release new videos thanks for joining everyone